bringing the, the best answer that I can for you all. Today's question could lead into a lot of rabbit trails. So I am not going to uh, allow myself to be distracted. I'm going to stick to the notes as much as I can so that we don't get uh, drawn into a thicket of stuff and end up missing the Super Bowl tonight because I can preach that long. But I want to begin with John's Gospel, chapter 11, hearing the words of Christ. John chapter 11, we encounter the story of Lazarus, the one whom Jesus loved, the man that lived in Bethany with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, Jesus was, was out in the countryside, and he got word that Lazarus was sick, sick to the point of serious condition. Jesus tarried a little bit longer there where he was, and when the next word came to him, it was that Lazarus had died. So Jesus and the disciples, they make their way to Bethany, where they find the home of Lazarus. And I want to pick up in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will, will rise again. Martha replied to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? Almighty God in heaven, who is God in life, in death, and in life beyond death. We gather before you in this place of life. But we also gather in a place that has been known to be touched by death. We hold services of celebration and remembering of loved ones and community members. We come and witness the lifeless body among us. But we come to sing with hope of what will happen in the life beyond this life. We come to praise you and declare our faith that there is a hope beyond death, that life does not end with the end of breathing or the heart beating, but that there is life that will continue and life that will go on continuing in your resurrection when we experience. So, Almighty God, give us the faith and the hope that is necessary to hold fast to these beliefs you have revealed through the risen Christ. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. And may our hearts and minds find comfort in the faith revealed in the risen Lord and the spirit of life who brought him up from the grave and now resides within us. Let us draw strength and encouragement from you, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So the question that I received was this. How will Christians know each other in heaven? How will we know if someone made heaven if we don't know our past or who we were on earth? Now, there are a lot of issues that are wrapped up in this question. And so I want to kind of, like I said, I'm going to stick to my notes with, with what I talked about because it's easy for, for us to kind of branch off and deal with a lot of different subjects. So I want, to, I want to narrow down my scope and deal with what is the most apparent issue that rises up out of this, and that is what do we know 
What will we know in the life that is after this life? When I read the question, I, I looked at it and I thought, you know, there's an easy answer to this because I know the answer, but I didn't want to just make it easy. I didn't want to just take an off-the-cuff response, so I began to research this and look into it and see, maybe I've seen a te- or I haven't seen a teaching somewhere. Maybe there's a, a church that teaches something a little bit different on, on the prospects of what we have to look forward to in the life after this one. And in my research, I found two things that, that really jumped out in my attention. The first one is this. There is no apparent teaching along the lines of not knowing one another in heaven or in the life after this life or not even knowing our past. The second thing that I noticed in my research was that there, are a, there seems to be a lot of people asking this question. There seems to be a lot of people who have a concern about what we will know in the life after this life. And and I think it's natural. I think it's there because there's still fear and doubt and, and a lack of understanding in what we will know in the life that is to come after this one. So in order to answer this question in right and appropriate ways, I felt it was necessary to go about answering this question in the wrong way. I felt it was necessary to actually go through scriptures and see, was, is there a possibility for somebody to take something from scripture and misinterpret it in, in a way that leads us to believe that we are disconnected between this life and the life to come? And guess what? It's very easy to find scriptures that can lead people down a path that produces this kind of question. Now, I'm not saying that's where this question came from. Like I said, I wanted to find the wrong answers before I started giving you the right answers. So I'm going to take you through some of the wrong answers. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone's it, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, now remember, these are possible. Ver- these are verses that people could possibly misinterpret. Because whether you realize it or not, when we come to Scripture and we read Scripture, we have filters that change depending on our mindset, how we are feeling emotionally. And if somebody is in the midst of doubt, if somebody's in the midst of their fears over death, if they're in their grieving process after having loved, uh, having lost somebody that they love very dearly, or they've lost somebody that they're concerned about their well-being in the life after this one, that mental mindset, that mental lens can cause us to think a little bit differently. In this passage, we have a couple of things to look at. One We regard no one according to the flesh, meaning that we don't think about them in the same way. We think about them in a different way. And then secondly, when we talk about being in Christ, they are new creation, the old has passed away, meaning that that which we were is now gone. Now, you have to keep in mind, 2 Corinthians begins, chapter 5, begins by talking about these earthen vessels and the home that we have here and now that is away from God and the distance that we feel, but that when we get rid of these earthen vessels and we step from this house into what God has for us, there is a transformation. There is a process. There is a possibility. Somebody could misinterpret this passage, in particular this, that the old has passed away when we become whatever it is that God has for us. The next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 and 51. I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And again, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. We talk about this life as flesh and blood. We talk about everything that's attached to this life as if it's a part of our physical experience and being here in life. 
And so when we talk about flesh and blood not inheriting the kingdom of God, how do we refer to our kinfolk? Our flesh and blood. That can't inherit the kingdom of God. It's perishable. It passes away. We will be changed. It's possible somebody could read that in a, in a sense of sorrow and think maybe they are going to lose something in that transforming. Next one, Matthew chapter 22. We, we read in 23 through 32, Jesus encounters the Sadducees, and the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. In, at this point in Jewish theology, the idea of a resurrection had creeped into Jewish thinking that the dead will be raised, which is what Martha is saying there to Jesus and what I read in John. But in 22, 30, uh, 23 through 32, the Sadducees put this question to Jesus. They say, okay, okay, got a question for you. Jesus, this guy and this girl get married, but they don't have any kids. And the husband dies. And so to follow the law, she marries the husband's brother. But he dies. So she marries the next brother. But he dies. And she marries the next brother. And it happens through seven brothers. But all of the brothers die. Now, just as a side note, I really want to question what kind of woman is this. But the Sadducees come around and they say, finally the woman dies. Now, you believe in the resurrection. When they are resurrected, who's she married to? And then we get Jesus saying this in 2230. In the resurrection, they are neither married nor given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. One possible reading of this is that when we die, we become angels. One misinterpretation of this is that we become angels in heaven. We are not the same kind of creature that we are now. But then we get over into Luke, which is a parallel of this. Same story, by the way, but Luke writes it a little differently. Luke 20, 34 and 35. Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. Meaning that in this age, right here and right now, marriage is a thing. But those who are considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, there's some questions here about what happens to the bond of marriage in the resurrection. What happens to married folk when they die and are raised in the glory of God? It seems from Jesus' mouth, that the bonds of marriage don't carry the same connection in the resurrection that they do here on earth. And so it would, be, it would be possible for people to see the breaking of that connection, the breaking of that tie, and husband and wife are not husband and wife anymore. All right, now let's go into a couple of uh, just real simple things. John 20, verse 14, Jesus is raised up. And Mary Magdalene comes to the grave, and she's there looking in the grave and wondering where did Jesus' body go. And she turns around, and she sees somebody she thinks is the gardener, and she says, Sir, where have you laid his body? But who was it? It was Jesus. Mary Magdalene did not recognize Jesus. The, the, the least that we can say is that Mary Magdalene is a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. She didn't recognize him. Luke chapter 24, verse 16. The disciples had left, to, a couple of disciples had left Jerusalem. They were on their way to Emmaus, and suddenly this person joins them, and they walk throughout the day all the way to Emmaus. It's getting late in the evening. They invite this person to join them at their, their dining, ta dining table. They sit there at the table, and only until Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and gives it to them, they don't recognize him. They don't know who he is. Now, all of these passages, each one by itself, could be misinterpreted to lead somebody to believe that there is some kind of break that happens in the transformation from this life into the life that is after this life. But then if you take all of these passages and you weave them together with a thread, even as sketchy as that thread may be, 
it can lead to a problem concerning what the life after this life will be like. Now, those are all the wrong answers. Let me give you the right answer. Let's start with this. We do not know what the life after this life will be like. Because we don't have an abundance of solid reference material to build from in order to bring us to a clear understanding of what life after this life will be like. There are only two pictures painted of the life after this life in the New Testament. But the two pictures that are painted, we kind of have to take a little bit lightly. The first one is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16. There's a rich man and there is a poor man, a beggar named Lazarus, who dies. The rich man goes into a place of horribleness. Lazarus goes into a place that is called the bosom of Abraham. Now, Lazarus calls out and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. And later he says, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, this is Jesus telling a parable. Jesus is telling a parable not about heaven or hell or life after this life. He's talking about about how we live in the here and now. But he uses this parable to give us this picture, this image of life after this life in these two places. Lazarus is in this place of reward. And the rich man, whom, by the way, we don't even have this guy's name, he's in this place of torment. Now, in this place of torment, two things to notice. One, he remembers Lazarus' name. Lazarus was a beggar who sat outside the gates of his compound, outside the gates of his property, and begged from him. But he never gave Lazarus anything. But he remembered his name. Two, he remembered his father's house and his five brothers, and he asked for Father Abraham to send Marley's ghost to Ebenezer Scrooge and tell them what's going on. So in this story, we have the image of the rich man remembering Lazarus, who is in the other side, and his brothers who are still living. The other picture that we have painted for us comes from Revelation. Revelation 6, 9 and 10, the fifth seal is broken, and John sees... Under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? John's vision comes to him and he sees the martyrs for the faith dwelling under this altar, obviously in heaven, crying out for justice against those who did injustice to them. Notice two things about this. First of all, they remember the, the, the injustice that was done to them, and they remember who did it. They fully recollect what happened on earth. They're mindful of that experience in heaven. Okay? Now, these two pictures cannot be taken literally because one is a parable, and the other is a vision. Jesus used parables as teaching moments. He used them as teaching elements. So when he said things like, the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl that somebody buries in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a coin that gets lost in a dirty house. The kingdom of heaven is like a lost son who spends all of his wages and a father who welcomes him back. That's a parable. It uses something to kind of teach but it uses imagery to be able to capture the mind of those who are listening. The second thing is, in Revelation, we're talking about a vision. And the imagery of a vision is filled with symbolism. And there are times when we have to unpack that symbolism so we don't jump right into literal understandings of these stories, but we can begin to take a little bit of understanding 
in the way that they are presented to us. So those are the only pictures of life after life that we are presented with. What we need to do is we need to look at the only true and living proof that we have of what life after life will be like, and that is to look directly at the resurrected Christ. That is the only living proof we have of what life will be like after this life. We have to look at what he said. We have to look at what he did. That's the only way that we can consider what we may have to look forward to. So, let's go through it and see what Jesus said and did after he was raised. Quite honestly, he recognized and remembered people. We go through the resurrection account. In John chapter 20, verse 16, Mary Magdalene says, Sir, where have they buried the body? Because she didn't recognize Jesus. But Jesus responds to her with one word, Mary. And the way that he says it is filled with that connection that she had with him before so that when he says her name, she instantly knows. My Lord, it's you. He remembers her, and he remembers her so well that he can carry that same emotional bond that they had in life, in his life after this. Secondly, John chapter 20, verse 19. The disciples had gone and they had gathered in a room and Jesus appears among them. Interesting thing to think about. How did Jesus know where the disciples were? You can't Google the room where the disciples are. In fact, tradition tells us they went back to the upper room where they had the Passover meal. Tradition tells us that they were gathering for a follow-up meal to the Passover. Jesus remembered where they met. And then he gathered with them. Now, how did he not end up appearing a bunch of, among a bunch of random people? It's because he remembered the disciples. In fact, when he gathers with the disciples, his presence there is one of comfort. Because the first thing that he says to them is, Peace be with you. He knows the disciples. He's there to bring them comfort. All of them except one, Thomas. Thomas is not there that night. And it will take eight days before Jesus will appear again when Thomas is with them. John chapter 20, verse 27. He's there specifically to make sure that Thomas knows the truth of his resurrection. But there's something else that we get in that very same verse. In John 20, 27, what proof does Jesus offer Thomas for his identity? Touch my hand. Put your hand, your finger, in the nail print. Put your hand in my side. Jesus remembers the details of his crucifixion. He remembers what was done to him on the cross, and he offers those to Thomas as the proof of who he is. John 21, verse 6. Peter and James and John, those fishermen, Peter decides, you know what? I'm going to go back to my life. I'm going to go back to the life that I knew before Jesus because we don't know what we're going to be up to. And so Peter goes fishing with some of the other disciples, and they're out there on the water, and somebody appears on the shore and hollers out, hey, why don't you toss your net on the other side? Peter says, that's Jesus. How did Jesus appear to Peter the first time? He showed up on the side of the Sea of Galilee and says, hey, why don't you throw your net on the other side? Jesus remembers the first time he met Peter, James, and John, and he uses that to identify himself that day with his disciples. And then in John 21, 15 through 17, Jesus looks at this fisherman and says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times Jesus calls him by name, Three times. He 
says this, do you love me? To make up for the betrayal of Peter, where Peter denied him three times on the night of the cross. Jesus remembered all of those that he loved. Jesus recognizes them in their circumstances of life. He remembers them in the life after his life. But some of you are saying, well, that's Jesus. He's God. He gets a special pass. He's got a different skill set than us. Well, I might remind you that these very same disciples would go on to talk about this stuff, and it was Paul who comes up with this verse. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In the Old Testament's offering and sacrifice system, the first fruits were the first of everything else. They were the first of the kind that was given. The first fruits were taken from the harvest. They were the ones that were received in at the very beginning. They were received in out of everything else that was like them and they were given. The disciples began to talk about Jesus' resurrection and by the time Paul hears about it, he begins to think about it. He says, you know what? Christ was raised from the dead, the first of the kind that the rest of us will experience. The first of the kind that anyone who is in him will know. You'll also find that follow-up in verse 23 of that same passage. But Paul also touches on something. The resurrections that we have with Jesus and us, they are linked and they cannot be separate.
whisper a prayer.